So it is my pleasure at this point to introduce Rosie Gomez from the Administration of Family. Rosie is a program specialist and has been supporting our heart efforts through a grant through ACS, um, both on an o the overall response to in the United States, as well as our efforts locally in Connecticut and many other states across the country. Rosie? Great, thank you. Welcome. And as Tammy mentioned, I am work at the Children's Bureau at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And one of my roles is the federal project officer for a group of grants that's focused on building the infrastructure within child welfare to address trafficking using a multi-system approach. And Connecticut's Human Anti-Trafficking Response Team, or HART, was one of the grants that was funded to do this important work. One of the important aspects of the grant program is to disseminate best practices throughout the grant so that others in the field can learn about some innovative approaches. So as our grants are going into the fifth year of a five-year grant, I'm really pleased to see that Connecticut is sharing some of the lessons learned some of the strategies that they have learned um, and some of the successes that they have had. So I want to thank HART for their work over the last four years, for their strong partnerships that they have made, and mostly and more import most importantly, for their dedication to the important topic of human trafficking. And I know you will learn a lot from them and their partners in today's webinar. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Vanessa Trohan and I'm with Polaris, a Washington DC based organization which operates the National Human Trafficking Hotline. So to get everyone on the same page, I just want to briefly cover the federal definition of human trafficking. Human trafficking became a federal crime in 2000 with the passage of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act or TVPA. The TVPA criminalizes human trafficking and defines it as a crime involving the exploitation of someone for the purposes of compelled labor or a commercial sex act through the use of force, fraud, or coercion. The TVPA also establishes victim protections and clarifies that victims can be anyone, women and men, adults and children, citizens and non-citizens alike. Under the U.S. federal law, human trafficking includes both sex and labor trafficking. Sex trafficking is divided into two distinct subcategories, adult sex trafficking and child sex trafficking. Under the law, an adult is sex trafficked when they're induced to perform commercial sex by means of force, fraud, or coercion. However, when a person younger than 18 years of age is induced to perform a commercial sex act, it is a crime regardless of whether there is any force, fraud, or coercion. This is distinct from labor trafficking cases. In cases involving both adults and children, traffickers must have used force, fraud, or coercion to compel the victim to provide labor and or services. It's important to clarify that the crime of trafficking actually occurs when the victim is exploited for sex or forced labor, not when the victim is moved from one location to another. The AMP model or the action means purpose model provides another way to understand human trafficking. Typically, think of this as three buckets or if you're mathematically inclined, three elements of an equation. Action plus means plus purpose equals human trafficking. The one exception is for minors, so that's anyone under the age of 18 that's induced into commercial sex activities, there is no force, fraud, or coercion requirement. You just need to prove the action and the purpose. So between December 2007 and December 2017, the National Human Trafficking Hotline received over 178,000 signals, phone calls, text messages, emails, uh, chats referencing nearly 45,000 potential victims of human trafficking. The heat map reflects the number of potential cases of human trafficking reported through the hotline. As you can see from this heat map, 
the National Human Trafficking Hotline has received reports about human trafficking from every single state in the United States. Please note that the statistics provided today do not reflect the overall prevalence of human trafficking in the United States. It provides one perspective, the national hotline's perspective, and the data that we share is exclusively from calls and signals that come directly to the national hotline. While you're able to see some of the hotbeds for trafficking across the map, the gaps are not indicative of low prevalence of trafficking in those communities. Rather, it's a lack of awareness both about the issue of trafficking as well as of the national hotline. So the hotline has received reports of trafficking involving children, youth, or adults, girls, boys, or transgender individuals, citizens or non-citizens, youth living with family, foster care, in residential facilities, or who are homeless. Of the 42,000 cases of trafficking we have heard about and responded to, 12,900 of those cases involved minor victims. I just want to draw your attention to the category of sex and labor trafficking cases. These are categorized as such to exemplify cases where there are both elements of both sex and labor. So an example of this is an individual who is forced to dance in strip clubs, so that's a labor activity, um, as well as forced to engage in commercial sex activities. For the category um, other and not specified, these are instances where we get calls from victims who self-identify or from professionals in the field who are working with survivors of trafficking and are able to disclose any of the trafficking details because of confidentiality. It's important to state that the data for sex trafficking cases are generally higher, not because sex trafficking is highly prevalent. It's because there is a lot more awareness and education about sex trafficking. Hopefully, with more attention and education directed towards labor trafficking, we'll start to see these numbers increasing as it is extremely pervasive and has equally egregious elements of exploitation and coercive practices. So further breaking down these cases, So, sorry, technical difficulties, my slides are not moving. There we go. So, further, to further break down these cases, we're talking about the 12,900 cases. Um, I wanted to show you sort of some of the top venues that we are seeing both sex trafficking and labor trafficking cases. So, internet-based, where the internet is used to set up dates and to advertise commercial sex services. Uh, residence based could be brothels, residential brothels, both um, organized networks or informal private residences. On the labor trafficking end, I wanted to highlight traveling sales crews. These are individuals that go door to door from house to house to sell magazine subscriptions, for example. This network exclusively or almost exclusively recruits U.S. citizen teens and young adults. I now want to pass it on to Tammy, who will talk to you about Connecticut's response to trafficking. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, thank you for sharing the kind of landscape of trafficking across the country, um, what we're seeing um, in different pockets of the state and calling attention to the awareness needs in, in multiple states. I'm hoping folks can hear me. We're getting a couple emails saying it may not um, be coming through as loud and clear as we'd like it to. So we're trying to talk closer into the microphone and um, trying a couple other things. So if you continue to have challenges, please put it in the chat box so we're aware that it continues. So I would like to, at this point, bring it to Connecticut regarding human trafficking, what we are seeing, what we are doing. Um, and we'll end today's session with talking about our strengths, some of our continued challenges, and some of our next steps. So in Connecticut, we have some particular definitions that we use quite often, and we wanted to ground you in those definitions to get us started. Um, first of all, Department of Children and Families is DCF. We are the child pro uh, protection provider in the state of Connecticut. Uh, we have our human anti-trafficking response team. We call that HART, H-A-R-T, and we'll talk about what that means. We have a task force in Connecticut. We call it our human trafficking task force operated under the U.S. Attorney's Office that includes partners such as the FBI, Homeland Security, State's Attorney's Office, 
and local law enforcement. We will use the term domestic minor sex trafficking throughout the day. And again, we're talking about the exchange of any sex act of a minor for anything of value. Multidisciplinary teams, those are our multidisciplinary teams that are across the state of Connecticut that are well staffed with professionals in law enforcement and mental health and medical service providers that address cases of child sexual abuse, severe physical abuse, as well as um, child trafficking cases. And you'll hear more about that this afternoon as well. And finally, our child advocacy centers, our CACs. Those are the safe, child-friendly um, centers that provide a number of services to our young people um, and the non-offending caregivers. In Connecticut, I wanna give you just a really quick overview of how we're set up because I know lots of states that we've consulted with try to take some of what we are doing and make it work in their particular state. So hopefully this will be helpful. But in Connecticut, we have 13 judicial districts throughout the state and we have six um, regions within our child protective service system. So within our six regions, we have 14 area offices across the state. Um, again, all working collaboratively um, within the overall structure of the Department of Children and Families. Cases in Connecticut of child trafficking all primarily go through DCF Caroline. DCF Caroline was developed uh, developed a protocol to respond to these cases, whether or not the cases involved a parent, guardian, guardian, or entrusted caregiver. The challenge that we often face is we cannot substantiate on a, a non-guardian, um, non-parent uh, offender, but we certainly can still respond to the needs of that child and that family. And we'll talk about those dynamics throughout the afternoon. So when the call goes into Caroline, um, those calls, the information from that report is sent to the local law enforcement. So local, local law enforcement can follow up in these cases. The report then goes to the heart director, which is my position, and our local heart liaisons, which you'll hear about this afternoon. Uh, we do a couple of things with the cases at that point. I ensure the cases go to our human trafficking task force. So the U.S. Attorney's Office and all the partners on the task force will review the cases to see if it's a case that um, they will be working on directly or how they can support local law enforcement in their efforts. I then also send the case to the multidisciplinary team. And we put this step in process to ensure that step was not missed. And it's an important process that we will go into in a few minutes. The heart liaison um, at this point is very focused on that child. So they are ensuring they're partnering with local law enforcement. They're ensuring that child, that family um, receives services. Um, and we'll talk about those services shortly. There is another way we see cases at definitely a smaller percentage, but we have cases where we have an open or an active case within the Department of Children and Families where social workers are working with children and families and learn that a young person may be a victim of trafficking. At that point, the social worker within that local office will reach out to the heart liaison for a heart consult. And they will talk about what are some of the specialized services that may be helpful to that young person. What are some of the outreach we need to do with our local law enforcement and our MDT? I then take a very similar role as when the case comes to the care line and I ensure the task force is included on these cases and again, make sure, ensure that the multidisciplinary teams are included in these cases. We'll dive into the regional response in a couple of minutes. You will see up here the HART organizational chart. HART overall is a statewide group, about 125 members strong at this point. We have law enforcement at all levels. We have medical providers, mental health providers, service providers, an incredible faith-based network, all working together to look at how Connecticut overall is responding to cases of child trafficking. We have uh, six committees that were pulled from our retreat last year that focuses our efforts from uh, on a 12-month basis. We meet again in October to relook at our committees and our efforts to decide are those areas we need to continue to focus on or are there new areas we need to address. 
Um, of interest here is school outreach. We have learned from our kids, and you will see this in some of the data, that th there's a missed opportunity of educating kids in our community and kids really feeling as if that can would be helpful to come through the school system. Also, we are looking at labor trafficking right now. We've had very few cases of labor trafficking, and we are trying to um, understand what labor trafficking looks like in the northeast corner of the country um, so we can start to identify these cases, reach out to these kids, and provide services. So uh, definitely a focus area for us long term. All right, technical difficulties. Oh, here we go. We have several pieces of legislation in Connecticut that um, have been uh, voted on and approved over the last few years. In fact, over the last probably 10 years, every year we've had a piece of legislation um, that has increased or enhanced our response to child trafficking in Connecticut. The only year in exception is this past year where we had a very important piece of legislation in Connecticut put forth to align Connecticut with the TVPA that um, died at the end of the session. So we will again focus on that this year. But in short, uh, minors under the age of 18 in Connecticut cannot be arrested for prostitution. Victims of child trafficking are guaranteed an affirmative defense and have the right, the right to vacate related juvenile records. We can classify a child as uncared for, so we can provide some specific services to young people that are victims of trafficking. All cases of child trafficking in Connecticut must come through the DCF care line. Again, it doesn't mean that we're gonna open an investigation. What it does mean is that we will ensure law enforcement gets the information needed to respond on the legal side of the case. And we, as child protection, will ensure that child and that family has services. The cases now in Connecticut we, under legislation are required to go to our multidisciplinary team. And we think that's a good thing. So we were excited when that passed. And then last but certainly not least, we have a new piece of legislation, um, commercial sexual abuse of a minor that um, can be charged on the demand side. So the buyers that are actually buying sex from children. Unfortunately, we have not seen any arrests under this piece of legislation. We are hoping with increased awareness, we will start to see um, our law enforcement partners utilize this legislation. So briefly, I'm going to go over some data that we've seen in Connecticut. And as you can see, over the last 10 years, our data has significantly increased. People will ask me across the country, is it because there's more trafficking in Connecticut? Um, or what is the reason we think that the numbers are going up? And, and I think it's twofold. I think one, the rates of child trafficking are increasing. I think the internet makes this a very um, profitable criminal industry. So we see the numbers go up. But I also think the increased awareness, training, community presentations has also increased the numbers. I am a bit concerned with the numbers of boys and our, our transgender population. We are not close to the national numbers that folks are seeing across the country. So we're, we have a very concerted effort looking at boys um, in our LGBTQI community and how, how do we educate communities, how do we reach out to the young people that are survivors, and how do we engage them in services. Race and ethnicity, we have seen um, young people from across the state from various race and ethnicities affected by child trafficking. We have seen kids of color, the highest percentage. Um, we watch this number, these numbers on an annual basis to see what communities we should be reaching out to, see how we should be partnering with law enforcement. So it's very helpful information to have. Age of victimization. Sorry, I'm not seeing one of the charts, but hopefully it's up there. Age of victimiza victimization. We are seeing an increase in the younger folks. Um, be victimized in our state. I don't think that slide is showing up for you, but we've had an increase in numbers of 10 and under and an increase in numbers of 11 and 12 year olds. Um, so that's of great concern. Most of our youth curriculums focus on ages 12 and up. So we're, look, we're looking at how do we need to modify that. This slide in particular, I think is very important. I continuously hear across the country that the majority of victims are kids in foster care 
or in congregate care. And yes, we do have kids in congregate care and foster care being victimized. But the vast majority of the kids that are victimized in Connecticut are living at home at the time of victimization. So the reason I like to point that out is if we're just focused on educating kids that are in some sort of congregate care type setting, we are missing a huge population. We have to get to the kids in the schools, in the community. So I would like to bring in Krista Ryder. She is one of our very seasoned heart liaisons that will talk to you about the very specific regional response to trafficking cases, starting off with a case that didn't go so well before we had a lot of these pieces in place. So as Tammy mentioned, I'm gonna talk about um, a case where various stakeholders were not really partnering well um, together and it actually greatly impacted the youth. Um, so it was a 17 year old um, female who was actually uh, residing at home with her family. So again, back to Tammy's point, it was a child who was you know, living in the community, not a kid who was in care or in a current care setting. Um, and she was being posted on a website um, and subsequently, we, you know, she's a DMST victim. Um, so we were able to try to engage the law enforcement to try to um, have the legal process start. However, um, the lead uh, local uh, law enforcement who was responsible for the case refused to take the case as they viewed her as um, a juvenile delinquent versus a victim. Um, simultaneously, uh, we had referred the youth to the MDT case review, kind of in an effort to keep the conversation focused on the youth um, and her needs, uh, since we were able to kind of um, address them via legal um, pathways. Um, the department also um, tried to um, connect this youth with DMSC specific resources um, and services. Um, both the youth and her, her mom was open and ready to accept services. However, the child's attorney um, would not consent to those services. Um, and kind of the rationale behind that was really around, she was um, concerned her client would um, incriminate herself. And throughout this kind of process that we were um, going through, um, the youth continued to get arrested. Um, she was detained. Um, and eventually she became, um, she ended up on juvenile parole. Um, ultimately, the youth was able to get services, um, but it wasn't timely and it wasn't without um, many challenges. So here um, we have two pictures of our um, regional heart teams. Um, every year we have a contest uh, and these were two of the recent winners. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the regional response. Tammy shared a little bit how um, um, heart works at a larger level, and this is at the regional level. So um, there's, like Tammy referenced, two pathways. Um, so they're either a new new case from Caroline or it's an open active case. Um, so uh, the heart liaison will um, provide a consultation with the social worker or whomever's um, giving us this information. We complete what we call a DCF heart decision map, which kind of determines the level of risk and helps us kind of guide our practice and our next steps. At that point, we're also potentially reaching back out to Tammy and the um, Human Trafficking Task Force as we get maybe have more information. Um, and we might also triage the cases at, at, at the larger level within the region um, with our regional uh, heart team. Um, and then we go to MDT. So at this point, we kind of have a conversation with the MDT case review team to determine um, what makes the most sense. Does this youth, um, you know, should we do a, a forensic interview? Um, and there's kind of some risks doing that with this population. What we've learned, sometimes kids are scared, um, they're guarded, maybe they're protecting um, a, you know, the perpetrator. And so we really kind of have a conversation to see what makes the most sense for that particular case. Um, it's also important to, um, to point out that if the case is being, um, the, the lead agency is the FBI, they will do their own interview. Um, so they, they wouldn't necessarily go through this process. Um, so once we kind of get through that, um, there's always, you know, trying to connect youth and families with um, uh, services that meet their individualized needs, um, and we'll go into that uh, momentarily. Um, and then once the individualized needs of the youth and their family um, are mitigated, um, and there's no other kind of safety concerns, um, DCF will go ahead and close their case. 
So some of the existing resources um, in Connecticut, um, we have the Youth Awareness Curriculum, which is a newer curriculum, um, and that's a one-time um, awareness curriculum where uh, you kind of, it's not that taxing, you can do it in a school assembly, you can reach a lot of kids in a very short amount of time, um, and so that's kind of some of the work we're looking to do um, moving forward. Um, there's a few groups, so there's not a number, which is a five-session group. Um, and it is inclusive of girls and boys and our LGBTQI youth. Um, there's also um, My Life, My Choice, which is typically in long-term settings. Um, we have those survivor care um, and rapid responses. Rapid responses are a one-time psychoeducational kind of safety planning um, meeting where um, it's uh, ref reflected to the, the needs of that particular youth, so not everyone gets the same information. It depends on that youth and what they need. Um, and survivor care is kind of an extension where it's a, they work with youth over a long period of time to help mitigate some of the concerns. We also um, have, uh, we work with our therapeutic foster parents, um, and so there's a cohort of folks who have received, you know, the three-day training that's inclusive of understanding boys, understanding girls, in the intro to DMST in Connecticut um, training. Um, and, you know, with the hope to be able to accommodate the kids who do need placement in a foster care um, and really be able to support them. Some of the challenges we're running into is that um, there's a significant need for foster homes. And so sometimes non-DMST kids are being placed in those homes. And so when we need them for, for our, our kids um, who are affected by DMST, they're not able to go into those homes. We also have um, mentoring with folks who are, you know, again, go through a lot of our trainings, which uh, Tammy will talk about later. Um, and we also have the Wilderness School where Level 146 does a few um, events um, every year. Um, and then lastly, we have our Connecticut Provider Network. And so, and we really use our trainings to train them up to meet the individualized needs of the kids and the youth that they're working with. So I'm gonna hand it over to Crystal Rich from Connecticut Children's Alliance. Hey everyone, my name is Crystal Rich and I'm the director of the Connecticut Children's Alliance. We are Connecticut's membership organization for child advocacy centers and multidisciplinary teams. So today I'm just going to go over, uh, I'll give you a brief overview of CACs and MDTs in general and then talk about how we work in Connecticut and our collaboration to better respond to child trafficking. So what is an MDT? An MDT is a multidisciplinary team is comprised of professionals involved in investigating cases of child abuse and neglect, the prosecution of those cases, and provision of treatment services to victims and their non-offending caregivers. A CEC, as Tammy mentioned earlier, is the child-focused setting in which those supports and services are offered to the children and the non-offending caregivers. The, per the true purpose of this model um, is really to ensure a better collaboration between all of those partners who would typically deal with a case of child abuse regardless of whether or not the system existed. Um, but prior to this model being developed, what would happen is every discipline and every member worked in a silo. And so they would work with that child and the non-offending caregiver separately. And oftentimes it was just re-victimizing that child over and over again by making them tell their story multiple times. Um, so again, it reduces the uh, risk of breakdown in communication. Sometimes we have so many partners involved in our child abuse cases that if we don't have this multidisciplinary team process, they're not able to communicate and share information with each other. Um, and again, to ensure that the, the system that we really set up to protect our kids isn't then re-victimizing them by putting all this onus on their shoulders. So CACs and MDTs in Connecticut. So we have 10 child advocacy centers and 17 multidisciplinary teams across the state. What does this mean? So the number of child advocacy centers and teams means that every child across the state of Connecticut, if they experience one of the forms of abuse I listed earlier, has access to this model. We're really fortunate in that. I know that there are other states across the nation where CACs and the multidisciplinary team response isn't necessarily available across the state, but in Connecticut, we've been very fortunate to have that. Um, why are there 10 CACs versus 17 multidisciplinary teams? So as Tammy mentioned earlier, due to our structure, we don't operate on a county-based system like many other states across the nation. So we have some CACs that work with just one multidisciplinary team, and we have a couple of CACs that work with multiple multidisciplinary teams. And that really depends on the judicial districts they fall in, uh, depends on how large the DCF region is and what that population is like in that area of the state. 
So we are also fortunate, CACs, there are over 900 across the country and in many other countries around the world. And we all partner with an organization, a national organization called the National Children's Alliance. And what they do is they really ensure that we, all of our child advocacy centers are the services that they're providing and the response that our multidisciplinary team partners are providing is really based in, in best practice and evidence-based research. Um, so we partner with them. The, on the screen right now, you're seeing CAC standards. Every five years or so, they come up with a set of standards that, again, is based in uh, research and what, um, what our kids are telling us, what our non-offending caregivers are telling us, what our, uh, our multidisciplinary team partners are telling us is the best way to respond to our kids. So there's 10 standards. I won't go too in-depth into all of them, but you'll see that they really go into how that multidisciplinary team responds to those children um, and all the different services that can be provided to them. Again, so just in essence of time, I'm not going to go through each step of the process, but this is really how our Child Advocacy Center and MDT model works. So you'll see at the top it talks about when a referral is made to either law enforcement or DCF and how that channels through to our other multidisciplinary team partners, how it's brought together in a process called a case review where all the multidisciplinary team partners come together and discuss those cases, and then how they work with the Child Advocacy Center to ensure services are provided regardless of whether or not the case goes through prosecution or not. So MDT and CAC in child trafficking cases. So on the left-hand side, you'll see the model of how we collaborate, how we've been collaborating on child sex abuse cases, physical abuse cases, and neglect cases for years. So you'll see in the small bubble, it says MDT and coordinator. So in Connecticut, one of the, the fortunate things we have is all of our 17 multidisciplinary teams have a coordinator, so a specialized person who really works to make sure that the review of all the cases in each, each jurisdiction is done appropriately, that no child falls through the cracks, and that partners are able to communicate effectively and have the resources they need. So there's one coordinator to every team, and they collaborate with the Child Advocacy Center in their region. Um, as we started to take on the child trafficking cases back in 2014, we realized that there were so many additional complex variables associated with these cases. Many times we're seeing kids who have experienced poly victimization, multiple forms of violence, along with the trafficking. Um, and we recognized that we needed a lot of other players at the table that may not have been necessary for some of the other types of child abuse cases we were seeing earlier. So you'll see on the right-hand side our system now. So you still have the MDT and the coordinator working with the Child Advocacy Center. But as you heard Tammy and Krista talk about, you have the HART team also involved. They are a part of the MDT, but they are, are also within the department. And then you have the task force, the law enforcement response that may be involved in these cases as well. So this system really was set up over the past couple of years to make sure that everyone, again, was on the same page. Um, one, one of the things we also see in Connecticut is a lot of times these cases crosses over, cross over multiple jurisdictions. So this system ensures that everybody is getting all the same information. So some of the things that have helped us along the way inform our MDT and CAC response to child trafficking cases. So as Tammy mentioned earlier, there was legislation passed back in 2014 that mandated a multidisciplinary team response for child case trafficking cases. Um, and since we already had the multidisciplinary system set up across the state, it made perfect sense to just have those teams start seeing these cases. Now, again, as time went on, we realized we were missing a couple of partners from the table, and we had to revise some of our protocols and resources to, to handle the, the complexity of these cases, but the system and the foundation was still there, so we didn't have to completely reinvent the wheel. Um, and another piece of legislation that was really crucial for us in, in these cases in our system was passed back in 2017. Um, we had in legislation multidisciplinary team statute that outlined what our MDTs did. It was done in the late 1980s and hadn't been updated since, so we were missing crucial partners from the table, such as advocates, uh, not all the types of abuse, abuse cases that we were seeing and that we started to provide resources for over the years were listed in that statute, um, including child trafficking. So in 2017, we were able to update that. We also were able to define what a child advocacy center is in our state, which was also really crucial for us. Um, this gave us the opportunity to define a child advocacy center that is one that can meet those standards that I outlined earlier. Again, making sure that every child has the same access to the same quality of services across our state. 
Another really helpful tool in developing this response was something called an outcome measurement system. So this is a, it's three surveys. It was also developed by our national organization. And there are two, there are satisfaction surveys. There's two caregiver surveys and one um, survey that's designed for our multidisciplinary team partners. There's a survey that's given out if a child is given, is brought to a CAC for services and the caregiver can fill it out there. And then that same caregiver will be given an opportunity to provide uh, follow-ups information a couple of months later on to see how the resources that they were given are working out now. Um, the multidisciplinary team partner survey is given out statewide twice a year. And there's a, a lot of questions on here that really just help us inform our policies, protocols, legislation, and how we need to change our system. Once we started working and seeing the child trafficking cases at the MDTs, we realized that we wanted to, to survey our, not only our caregivers, but also our, our MDT partners to see if they had the resources they need to appropriately respond. So you'll see on the left-hand side in 2016, we added a question to the survey um, that says, as a member of an MDT in Connecticut, I have a clear understanding of my role addressing cases of domestic minor sex trafficking. You'll see there was a really good portion of the respondents that felt that they understood their role. But still, given we're a small state, and of course not every partner responded, we still had a decent amount that disagreed, and then some that did not find that it was applicable to their role at all. In 2017, asking that same question a year later, you'll see the vast majority of our partners, one, more people responded, but the vast majority of the partners agreed that they understood that role. Um, less disagreed, and one of the things that I think is really important to point out is less of them felt that it wasn't applicable, meaning that they started to realize that even if you're a member of a team, an MDT, and this case isn't yours, your expertise and your, you know, in the field and your expertise dealing with other cases is still really relevant, and it's crucial that we all understand the dynamics of these cases. Just some really quick stats again, just you can see the difference. So in 2016, 46% um, felt that there were enough services, 56% of MDT partners felt that they understood the system. Fast forward a year where a lot of training, as Tammy will go into later, was done. Um, you'll see 71% of the partners felt now that there was better services, and 81% felt that they started to understand the system. So not only their role, but everyone else's role in responding to these cases. Um, and last but certainly not least, caregiver survey. So the same thing, back in 2016 when we were first surveying our caregivers, a lot of folks felt, yes, we were given good information at the CACs and it was helpful. Fast forward a year where we learned a little bit more from our caregivers on what information they needed, what resources they needed. We started, we started to see higher numbers of them feeling supported. And we know research tells us if our caregivers feel better supported, those kids are gonna have a better outcome in the end. So all this information was really helpful for us. Um, we still have you know, things we have to enhance in our system, but the information from our partners and our caregivers has been extremely crucial. So now I'm going to invite back Krista Ryder to go over another case experience that comes after we developed a lot of these systems. So um, as Crystal stated, I'm gonna talk about um, a case where there's a lot of strong um, partnership between the case, um, the different uh, stakeholders um, who really advocated and ensured that this particular youth um, needs were met. Um, so it's a 16 year old female, again, a, 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 a young lady who was living in the community with her family. Um, and she also had some intellectual disabilities, which made her a little bit more vulnerable. Um, and that's something we see frequently. Um, and she was um, a victim of DMST and she also was um, kidnapped. Um, and so um, immediately, you know, we, we engaged law enforcement who were very, very responsive um, and, you know, communicated kind of all, all along the, the way. Um, she was also um, referred right away to our MDT. Um, and, you know, there was a, a, a lot of discussion and planning with respect to kind of what to do next. Um, and so we actually did go um, forward with a forensic interview. Um, but, you know, we had, you know, probably at least three pre-meetings with respect to kind of how do we do this? Who do we need at the table? What questions do we need to ask? Um, and really how to be mindful of the, of, of the youth psychiatric um, vulnerabilities at that particular moment um, and be supportive to her and not cause any you know, um, additional distress. Um, and so, um, also we were able to kind of engage the community, um, of uh, the providers who are working with that youth, um, cause she was inpatient at the time. 
Um, so really being creative around um, having, um, you know, we wanted services connected right away. Um, so we had the service provider go in it, going in and kind of just building um, a rapport and that relationship with that youth. So once she did return to the community, um, they could start working. Um, we provided a lot of clinical support to her with respect to kind of the process of the um, forensic interview, um, physically transported with her, um, you know, gave her, her support before and after the, the forensic interview, um, which made it really, really nice and didn't provide any kind of additional distress to her. Um, so I'm going to have um, Samantha come back up and talk a little bit about the youth perspective. Thank you. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. This is Samantha Lowry. Um, so I have the pleasure of being the evaluator um, from ICF. And um, we've been working alongside DCF, HART, all of the folks involved in this grant to really document the process. And what I'd like to share today is a little bit about that youth perspective. So what were, what were the youth sharing um, based on interviews we conducted with, with kids that had been served by HART or part of the response in Connecticut? So we asked each of the survivors to tell us how different stakeholder groups uh, could best help them. Um, here we wanted to capture in their own words uh, what they would suggest to law enforcement, service providers, DCF, um, or anyone that came into contact with um, to improve their experience and their care. Um, so for example, law enforcement, we asked them what would they tell police if they had an opportunity to share a little bit about their experience and the services that they received. So youth survivors had um, a, a fear of law enforcement and expressed that their, their limited exposure was due to a lack of trust. Um, that they had negative experiences with being treated as um, a criminal. One, one youth quoted, they didn't like police because when they were sexually assaulted and, and didn't do anything wrong, they still got arrested and handcuffed. One youth really wanted to tell police not to blame the victim and to listen and rather than talk. Comfort was also another finding. So comfort was paramount. Survivors desired a balance of rules and comfort given the important role that service providers play in their lives. The youth emphasized that an honest opinion was needed and a long-term support system. The adults in their lives changed often and bonds were often broken. The message to judges was to look beyond what was on paper and to listen to the survivor's perspective. The youth wanted to be more involved in the process and they wanted to speak directly with judges. Quote, judges typically lock up youth, which one youth provided when they're very open about their experience and cited them as the reason for continuing to run. Victims overwhelmingly agreed that they did not have a say in the types of services received, nor did they feel in control of their own lives or their care. They shared experiences of, of moving from system to system and desiring stability. In their words, from one survivor, I'm just doing this because I have nowhere to go, I'm on the run, and I don't want to get locked up again. So most of the youth survivors, 75% of them, had some prior knowledge of what the term human trafficking meant before their disclosure. And all the youth self-identified in their interview as a, as a victim. That's what they described themselves as. However, there was a striking disconnect between recognizing the term and understanding the various forms of human trafficking and how they relate to what the youth were experiencing. There were a variety of ways youth had first learned about human trafficking. So schools, schools had provided a very limited exposure to what trafficking was and what it looked like in the real world. Therefore, youth consistently shared that what they were experiencing in the life was not what they had thought human trafficking truly was. And it wasn't until they were rescued and someone helped, to, helped them to put the pieces together. The places and people that taught these young survivors about human trafficking included therapy, they talked about school presentations and programs, DCF was mentioned by many of the youth, Love 146, and hospital staff. Participants walked through their journey with us during these interviews, talking about services, when they were first identified, how they were referred. DCF was the most common source, 63% of identification and referral. Among this group of survivors, five of the survivors ident were identified by DCF workers. 
through a conversation and a description of the youth's experience. When we asked how youth victims were first identified, several youth shared that they could have been identified sooner if people in their lives had a better understanding of what they were seeing. They felt that they were coming into contact with the system and the system just wasn't seeing it. So as you can see, many of the survivors were identified while in care and very few by police. We also asked youth to talk about the types of services and the needs that they had to learn more about how they understood services and what the response should look like. We asked about what was missing and who they were most comfortable speaking with. As you can see here, youth most commonly saw their placement housing as a service. DCF was noted by all youth. Counseling and therapy was also shared by most of the youth. However, training such as not a number in my life, my choice, were only discussed when prompted. Group sessions and educational support was not included in their definition of services. Secure detention facilities, as you see on the right-hand side of the slide, for example, were home to a few of the youth survivors. It was defined as, by the youth, a locked-up facility for runaways, those that had been sexually exploited or for drug users. If you have nowhere to go or until they find somewhere else for you to go, it's a placement for kids, especially those on parole. Although the educational opportunity is offered at a placement facility like this, a secure detention facility, were seen in a positive light, many of the staff were highlighted for their strict adherence to the rules and attentiveness to the youth's needs. However, it was not a desired location according to survivors. Secure facilities made the youth feel less like victims and were familiar in that they exerted the same control that they were experiencing by traffickers. Love 146 on the left-hand side of your screen is another example. It was brought up in all of our interviews and known for their care backpacks. It had comforting staff that were highly involved in their care. This was the only service that youth described that was long-term and unbounded, which the youth found to be gravely important. Each survivor was asked to provide recommendations. We wanted to hear from them in their own words about how to best help survivors of human trafficking and to speak about how providers can improve those services for youth at risk of trafficking. These recommendations from survivors included guidance about raising awareness. Um, it also included uh, information about available services, connecting youth to appropriate services, and the ways to ensure survivors feel comfortable seeking services or telling their story. Participants shared recommendations uh, for various groups of people and places that, they, that could help raise awareness. This included schools, law enforcement, parents, guardians. One of the main priorities for raising awareness was to educate youth in schools. Multiple youth survivors stated that they did not become aware of human trafficking until after experiencing it firsthand or once they were rescued and in specialized schooling systems. Youth survivors also suggested that law enforcement should have more awareness of the needs of sex trafficking survivors. For example, one youth uh, referred to the fact that law enforcement officers often arrest without regard to whether the youth was a victim. A common theme in survivor recommendations was that survivors wanted parents and foster parents to become more comfortable and open to talk about bad situations involved in their daily lives and encouraging a healthy environment. Here we describe advertising and, and making purposeful connections to services. This was the second key recommendation. Half of the youth survivors suggested that service providers should have a more pronounced social, ne social media presence. Examples that were mentioned included Facebook, Snapchat, blogs, websites, even TED Talks, or apps for teens. Youth survivors felt that service providers should promote available services through billboards, posters, advertisements. Two youth survivors recommended school trainings or notices and posters on school property to share about resources. One youth survivor advocated for public events to raise awareness, such as a walk for awareness where service providers could share about their, their services. The youth survivors also suggested that law enforcement should be an available resource to them. A few of the youth had prior experience where they had not been treated respectfully by police, but they wanted to use police as a resource. Police were the most widely known entity for seeking help. However, fear was averting these youth from reaching out to them 
and seeking care. And lastly, the, one of the, the other major themes woven throughout the interviews was a desire for love, understanding sensitivity, and comfort. Regardless of the type of service, service provider, youth felt that the best way to make survivors comfortable seeking services and sharing about their experiences would be to offer verbal support through real conversations, provide more happiness in their lives, and to let their story come out more naturally. Love 146 was mentioned as a model program multiple times and described as the entity that was the most comforting. It was the program and staff that did not judge, asked the youth's opinion, and offered unconditional support. Across the board, survivors felt that their opinion was not accounted for, and service providers, particularly DCF, um, did not allow survivors to have a say in their services. Generally, survivors suggested that referrals should be more inclusive of their thoughts and concerns. Judges and law enforcement were two groups that youth recommended for training, particularly training of human trafficking and to learn about victim-centered approaches to justice. As you can see here, uh, we have provided a few demographics on the screen that share a little bit about the youth that we spoke to. But in summary, the youth survivors shared an eagerness to be heard, positive experiences with human trafficking specific care, and mixed experiences with traditionally less victim-centered services. Most of the youth had been in a variety of placement facilities, often moved from social worker to social worker, and were filled with experiences of judgment and being treated as a delinquent. However, they were resilient and able to articulate where the response in Connecticut did support them in their identification and recovery and where improvements could be made. Overall, these young survivors wish that, they, that those around them, including service providers, parents, and peers, would exhibit more understanding in their time of need and show compassion for them as people. Survivors decided a balance of rules and comfort. I'm now going to turn it back over to Tammy, and she's going to speak about the training. Thank you, Samantha. So in Connecticut, we had a lot to take on. Um, you heard from the youth perspective, which is extremely important to us. We also have adult survivors informing our heart team. So we were learning over the last few years of what were the gaps in our system and where did we need to um, prioritize our efforts. So the number one area we had to address was training. We had a lot of individuals in the community that were coming into contact with our kids that truly did not understand what trafficking was. And they needed a whole lot of training. So we tr really tried to understand how can we do this? How can we reach all of these different populations to educate them on trafficking with a budget that really did not expand our trafficking efforts? So in Connecticut, over the last few years, we've developed several curriculums. And really what we've used is we have our introduction to domestic minor sex trafficking, which is a two-hour curriculum, very focused on understanding trafficking, both at the national perspective, but a very clear focus on Connecticut. And that alone has started to allow people to understand what trafficking looks like in Connecticut. We were seeing that we had specialized professions that needed a very targeted approach, and we needed to adapt some of those curriculums such as law enforcement, such as um, education. We also had some legislation passed that required certain entities to be trained. For example, um, this year, as of July 1st, both law enforcement and educators must be trained and must be recertified in an annual basis um, in regards to child trafficking. So we did develop some curriculums that were um, that started with our intro curriculum, but also started to target some of the different areas that needed to be addressed in Connecticut. We have two full day trainings in our training academy that provides enhanced um, efforts and focus on how to work with these cases of trafficking once they're identified. And then we also have a very specialized curriculum for foster parents. What we learned with foster parents is that often they are working with these kids without even knowing it. But we also needed foster families that deliberately would take kids that are victims of trafficking. So we have a three-day curriculum for foster parents that include the basics of intro to domestic minor sex trafficking, but also include best practices for working with girls, um, understanding girls in a trauma-informed perspective. 
So not just on trafficking, but when you're working with certain populations, what are the areas that you need to pay attention to? What were our own biases? What, um, what do we know about kids and um, anxiety and trauma and how it impacts what the kids are making for decisions, how it impacts how we respond to our young people? Then we also have a boys component of that foster care training. So our curriculums really have evolved over the years, and I'll talk to you a little bit about how we roll them out. But the, the curriculums that you will see on the screen are the curriculums we currently have in the state. We do have two youth awareness curriculums that we primar primarily use in Connecticut. Krista did a great job of talking about them. Our youth awareness is that one-time intervention. We just need to get in the door to start to educate kids. And then our Not a Number curriculum, which is our prevention curriculum, we've seen rolled out in health curriculums in, in different schools with great success. We have seen programs after school or in school type activity programs that have worked. It's just trying to get them out to the masses has been a challenge and we'll talk about those reasons. These are the numbers of trainings we've done in Connecticut. So you can see we've done a whole lot of trainings and these are only the trainings that have been documented through HART. Uh, these are not inclusive of all trainings happening in Connecticut. But really important to know when we talked about the previous slide and all the different curriculums, our curriculums are all using the same language, which has been a really important effort in Connecticut. You know, every now and then we'll get somebody come from another state and they'll start talking about some data, they'll start using some terms that do not connect to what we're seeing in Connecticut. So we've been very deliberate in Connecticut with our curriculums to make sure the language has been consistent so we're all talking the same way. So we're all looking at these kids as victims. So in general, we've provided about 305 training sessions since 2016, training well over 7,000 individuals. We have done about 55 law enforcement trainings and about 1,100 law enforcement officers attending those trainings. I expect to see that number dramatically increase with the legislation that went into effect on July 1. We've had an influx of requests. School training sessions. We've had 52 training sessions for schools. About 33 of them were very focused on the kids, and about 19 of them were focused on faculty. I will tell you, when I have done trainings with faculty in the community, and we haven't done a lot of them, but when we've done them, People have walked in kind of wondering why they're there, saying that they, they were curious, you know, they know that this is happening um, across the world, but didn't think it was an issue in Connecticut. And I will tell you, the vast majority of folks walking out the door are telling us this should be mandatory. So it's about just getting this training in front of folks, and then the realization, all the other steps come naturally. People are invested. The youth awareness curriculum, which is very new, we've um, provided to about 761 students um, to date, and are not a number, which is our really our key prevention program. We've had 93 groups in Connecticut offered to about 572 youth uh, across the state. And then last but not least, we have a conference um, annually that um, HART partners with Connecticut Children's Alliance to ensure that we're looking at these cases as well as cases of general sexu sexual abuse of children um, and really understanding what is best practice across the country. What are we seeing? How can we improve our collaboration? This is a quick slide to give you some information on not a number. Again, we are seeing really good outcomes with this curriculum. It's very, very current. It is addressing the needs that we are seeing in the state of Connecticut. Um, and it's uh, it's pretty short curriculum. I mean, it's tough sometimes to get long-term curriculums into schools, but we have seen schools use this in some of the health curriculum. So to date, we've had about 12 facilitator trainings in Connecticut, thanks to Level 146, and that's three days of intensive training. We have about 117 facilitators in the state of Connecticut um, educating our youth in, in this five-session program. The, the way we've really taken this on um, is through our training, trainer, training of trainer efforts. And we've had no new funding to support this, um, but thank you to the commissioner for the Department of Children and Families and all the various partners we have. We've been able to really increase this dramatically. So we've taken on a TOT type approach, training of trainers. And it's usually a two-day training for folks that are coming in to be trained in a curriculum. 
two very intensive days. On the last day, folks have to do a training or teach back of certain slides to their particular group of folks that they went through the training with. And then their last step is to do a live training in the community with one of our lead trainers there to support them because we know how hard it is to do the first training um, in front of a large group of audiences. To date, we now have 152 trainers in Connecticut, and I will tell you that they come from all professions, private and public, faith-based community, all using the same curriculums, all using the same language, all helping us make a difference. They've been phenomenal. We have about 87 trainees right now that are getting prepared to do their teach back. We've done several TOTs of late for law enforcement so they can start to train their own departments and meet the legislative requirements. So we'll see a lot of those folks certified over the next few months. We meet with these folks annually. It's really important that we take a look at the curriculum to make sure what we are presenting is working for our audiences, it's working for our facilitators, we want to make sure the new evidence across the country in regards to trafficking is incorporated. We want to make sure what we're seeing in Connecticut's incorporated. So it's really a partnership. Once folks are trained and certified, they are considered faculty. And we get together and we review this all together so we make sure what's moving forward year by year really meets the current present needs in the state of Connecticut. Uh, and last but not least, because we're part of the ACF grant, we have been um, provided the opportunity to participate in the pre and post surveys that were designed for the nine um, states that are involved. And that really has given us information on what folks are coming into trainings with and what folks are leaving training with. And you will hear from Samantha now that will address what we've learned with our pre and post surveys. Great, thank you, Sammy. So as, as Tammy mentioned, I'm now going to talk about the training evaluations. And specifically, um, I'm going to talk about the surveys that were collected between October 2014 through June 2017. So as she just talked about, there are far more trainings than we're capturing here. We're still crunching those numbers, and we have a lot more to report back. Um, but this gives you a really good understanding of where they started and where they've been going. So what I'm going to talk about today is about 4,800 uh, surveys, and it spans 97 training events. They're pretty evenly split between uh, pre and post trainings. So we're looking at folks um, before the training happens and um, what their knowledge, their beliefs um, are at that time point and comparing that to um, the same survey at, at the end of the, the training itself. So the survey asked trainees about their field of work. Um, and as you can see here, there's a variation of types of fields um, that have been um, focused on to date. And so service providers, teachers, and child welfare professionals were the main groups in, in the years that I just mentioned um, that have attended these trainings. The survey also captured the trainee's position at his or her current organization. Teachers and law enforcement officers were the two largest groups, followed by mental health providers. We also did trainings um, specific to foster parents. So you can see that about 4% of the surveys came from that particular group. An overwhelming majority of participants reported that they were Caucasian. So you see 67% um, in the graphic. A third of respondents were African American and Latino or Hispanic. And the majority of participants were female at 75%. Nearly half of the trainees had more than 10 years of experience. So how did we assess? So each survey was divided into three different constructs, so level of knowledge, beliefs, and level of comfort. As you can see here, the level of knowledge contains 12 survey items where the trainee was asked to rate their knowledge on a scale of one to five, with five meaning complete knowledge or expertise. The survey asked questions regarding risk factors of trafficking, definitions, and other terminology. The second section, belief, included four items and asked about victim culpability, such as whether minors choose to engage in prostitution for money. These questions raised, ranged from one to 10, and 10 meant um, completely true. Level of comfort was the third. It was assessed using six items. Again, these ranged from one to 10, and 10 meaning that the trainee was completely comfortable with the practice or situation described. For example, we asked about their comfort having a conversation with the youth, 
to identify if he or she is currently being sexually exploited or is at risk of sexual exploitation. Here you can see the results from those three constructs. And just overall, what I wanted to demonstrate here was that there is significant change. We ran some statistical tests to look at this, and across the board, all three constructs were changing in a positive light. I'm going to get into more details on this particular piece. So across all fields, we took those same three constructs and looked at all of the fields of work, and we saw the same pattern of change. So average knowledge increased when comparing the score prior to the training to the level of knowledge after the training. So trainees came in with a little knowledge and left more knowledgeable, and this was a significant difference. You can see based on the color scales that child welfare workers and service providers came in slightly more knowledgeable and left more knowledgeable compared to participants in the law enforcement or the education field. So when you read these slides, the deeper color is showing more knowledge and similarly throughout. So here, again, across most fields in terms of beliefs, the statements were rated as being very false at the beginning and then after the training, they shifted more so in the direction of being completely false. This is the direction that we were looking for. Belief scores among participants in other fields of work did shift to some extent from very false to completely false. Again, what we were looking for. Across all fields coming into the training, most attendees were on the uncomfortable side of the spectrum. However, after the training, the average drastically improved with the average rating rising from 6.5 out of 10 meaning trainees were very comfortable after learning the content. The service providers and child welfare workers rated being more comfortable both before and after the training compared to their counterparts. Participants in law enforcement and in education field rated as being less comfortable, especially before the training. So what does this all mean? So overall, for all three constructs, there was a statistically significant difference that the training was having on knowledge, beliefs, and level of comfort all changing in a positive direction. As you can see here, we're further exploring items such as the lower ratings. There's a lot more detailed analysis to do, so stay tuned on that. But there's also been quite a bit of diversification in the trainings as Sammy, Sammy just shared. Um, so we do expect to see even more positive improvements in some of the groups I just highlighted, um, as well as uh, more change in these scores. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Vanessa again, and she's gonna talk about collaboration. Thanks, Samantha. So I'm just going to briefly cover some hotline data that we've collected for Connecticut, um, as well as provide a brief overview about the National Human Trafficking Hotline. So as you you've clearly um, seen from all the presentations that you've heard so far, the anti-trafficking response in Connecticut is extremely sophisticated and streamlined. And as such, Connecticut callers and citizens are feeding into that mechanism to report uh, tips and get assistance. And this is reflected in our data. We don't get as much calls from, from Connecticut, but I do have some data to share. In 2017, we received 190 signals from individuals who identified that they were calling or emailing or chatting from Connecticut at the time of their contact with the national hotline. We received about less than three signals from individuals who identified as minors. It's no surprise here, as Tammy mentioned earlier, they're focusing a lot on trying to increase awareness and education and identification and response to labor trafficking. So it's no surprise that a lot of the venues that we have seen through calls and signals that come through the hotline, that a large majority of them are sex trafficking related venues. So the National Human Trafficking Hotline is a national anti-trafficking hotline and lifeline serving victims and survivors of human trafficking and the anti-trafficking community in the United States. The toll-free hotline is answered 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Through a network of nearly 4,000 partner agencies, service providers, and law enforcement, trained hotline advocates take tips of suspected human trafficking incidences from community members and help survivors build plans so they can safely leave their situation or get the help they need to build their lives. The National Hotline is a multimodal hotline. We can communicate via phone in more than 200 languages through a translation service, um, as well as ta text, chat, email, and web form in English and Spanish. The National Hotline is operated by Polaris, as I mentioned earlier, and funded by the US Department of Health and Human Services and other donors. 
In March of 2013, Polaris launched and operated the Be Free text line with the goal of providing safe, secure, and confidential services and support entirely via SMS text messaging. Prior to January 2018, this was a service exclusively offered by Polaris, but in our recent grant award from HHS, we were able to incorporate the Be Free text line into the national hotline. Texting for us has been a fantastic resource to be able to reach minors and youth, um, as it provides, I think, an extra level of anonymity that uh, maybe a phone call does not. For individuals in sex trafficking situations, a phone is an essential component of their day-to-day, -day, and so accessibility is a little bit easier. However, it's also a very risky endeavor, and so we do a lot of safety planning and support through the hotline as well, both via text and chat. So you may all be familiar with the um, stages of change model. This was developed in the late 70s and early 80s to help understand how smokers um, were either able to give up their habits or their addiction. The idea of this model is that behavior change does not happen in one step. People tend to progress through different stages on their way to successful change. Each individual progresses differently and at their own rate and um, could re relapse at any point um, during this process. This is all to say that the hotline is available to assist signalers at any point during this stage of change. The role of the hotline is to provide a safe, non-judgmental space for the signaler to process, talk and access options whenever they are ready. The hotline is available to listen, support and validate the individual's feelings and efforts to want to leave and still be available when those plans don't pan out. In that case, we do a lot of safety planning and continue to provide support. So the hotline is a fantastic and useful resource uh, to a community's re response to trafficking. Because we focus on a single issue, we're able to take the breadth of calls that come through the hotline, triage them, and then send them send st stakeholders on the ground just relevant um, tips and information that is that is appropriate and relevant for the work that they do in their respective communities. The hotline maintains a national responders database with personalized information for all stakeholders and partners working on the issue of human trafficking, so survivors can be contacted to specialized services 24 hours a day, no matter the year, to agencies and stakeholders that can actually support them. Human trafficking cases are often multi-jurisdictional and multi-state, the National Hotline is best positioned to formulate responses and to connect these dynamic cases and facilitate reporting to law enforcement and allied par partners and connect survivors to service providers that can provide assistance and support. And then lastly, I just want to mention the National Referral Directory, which is a comprehensive, one-of-a-kind directory developed for the purpose of providing access to critical emergency, transitional, and long-term service referrals. Our directory is, is only as good as the members that ap apply to be a part of it. So if you're a service provider or an allied professional, I encourage you to visit our website and apply to be part of our organization. We refer back to our partners in that state to help vet these organizations to ensure that we are connecting callers to the national hotline to the best resource in that state or community. And then lastly, this is a, this is a chart that I think the national hotline is most proud of. Um, after 11 years of operating the National Hotline, we are seeing a steady increase in calls directly from survivors. This to me, us, means a lot because survivors are looking at the National Hotline as a safe space that they can call anytime, to, at any point in the year and get assistance and connect it to local stakeholders um, on the ground. And this is a testament to all the wonderful partnerships that we've built with stakeholders working on this issue throughout the country. And so now I will turn it to Tammy, who will close out with strengths, challenges, and next steps. Thank you, Vanessa. And I also want to reiterate the um, strength of the hotline, in particular for the victims themselves. It's uncomfortable, I think, for folks to call DCF Caroline. They will certainly accept a call from a youth, and they have in the past and have, have done well with it. But it is much more comfortable to call an entity that's very focused on child trafficking. 
and we actually use the national hotline number in all the materials we use with our kids. So in the rapid responses we provide with youth, um, where they get that backpack that was mentioned earlier, and we do a lot of focus on safety planning, they get that number in that backpack on a specialized card, on a bracelet, so forth and so on. So it's very, very helpful to our young people. So I'm going to try to bring us to a close and summarize everything we talked about today. Um, in general, we, t we started with an overall perspective from Polaris Project, which I think was very, very helpful so we can understand what we're looking at across the country. Then we zoned in to what Connecticut looks like. We talked about Connecticut's heart team, uh, the bigger heart team, which includes many, many partners very committed in Connecticut to addressing trafficking. Um, and I will tell you, on an interesting note, Heart was a very tiny, small group of DCF staff super committed to this effort probably eight, nine years ago. Um, so we went from probably a team of maybe a half a dozen to you know, 120 individuals from across the state. So huge evolution in how we've done our work as a state. And the realization it's not just about child welfare. It's really, well, child protection. It's about child welfare, which really is a statewide, community-based issue. Um, DCF, we're child welfare, we're tra child protection. We need to engage our communities because our communities are where the kids are coming from. So in general, we talked about HEART overall, and then we brought it closer at the regional level to hear about a case that really went poorly because of the lack of investment from our different providers to a case that went well, where we saw our partners working together to ensure that young person was not re-traumatized by multiple interviews, to ensure that child had the services she needed. Um, so we saw kind of the results of a better um, practice in regards to our efforts in the state of Connecticut. We heard about the important work that our multidisciplinary teams do and our child advocacy centers and how they now play a key role in this effort. So it was, it was a great process, I think, for us to understand the process um, moving forward. I'm sorry, I'm getting some hand signals trying to wonder what they're saying. So to wrap it up, let's talk about our strengths. First of all is our heart partnership. Again, without the folks at the table, we would be at a very different place um, at this time. We are survivor informed. So we have survivors that are public informing our system, and we have survivors that are not public, that only either myself know or the service provider know that is informing our system. And we respect it either way. As long as we have survivors informing what we're doing, we feel we're going in the right direction. We have, thanks to the commissioner and our leadership team at the Department of Children and Families, our care line is the centralized location for these calls to come in. No matter what the dynamics of the case is, we will ensure that child and family get services, and we will ensure law enforcement has the information they need to move forward on the case. We have a wealth of training resources, and thank you to all our partners across the state that have stepped up on their own time, become certified trainers to help us spread the word in Connecticut. We have um, partnerships that are vital, child welfare, MDTs, our Human Trafficking Task Force operated by the U.S. Attorney's Office. No one agency, no one person can do this on their own. We have specialized services. We are extremely fortunate to have Love 146 in the state of Connecticut. They're known across the world. To have them providing survivor care services in Connecticut, we are, it, it, it's invaluable. And our kids tell us that, and you saw that in some of the outcome data. And then we have school-based curriculum. Kids are telling us we need to educate them in schools. We're hoping as we start to train more schools, we'll get more requests to educate kids. So that uh, has been a huge resource for us. Our challenges continue to be cases that cross state lines when our kids are um, victimized in other states or um, kids from other states are victimized in Connecticut. So really working on those partnerships and again, I think um, collaborating with Polaris. We have victim service barriers, confidentiality and privilege. We have kids being denied services because folks are worried the kids will incriminate themselves hence the, the further law enforcement um, engagement that you saw earlier mentioned. The other issue is our resources. We have some wonderful resources in Connecticut and we wanna make sure that they're all data driven. One of the challenges we have is we still hear from people they want secure care for these kids. 
And we've been very clear that that's not appropriate for victims of trafficking. So that, that dynamic has played out a little bit in Connecticut, and I think we'll continue to see that play out. But I think the data is informing the realities that that's not what works for kids. And our kids clearly told us that's not what's working for them either. We have some challenges with leg legislation. We have to pass our current legislation um, that we proposed last year to ensure we align with the TVPA. It's really unfortunate that we're behind the eight ball on that. Uh, we have underserved populations. We mentioned the LGBTQI and our boys population, and we also have to get a better understanding of trafficking. Next step, we're going to continue to strengthen our partnerships, such as with Polaris for our out-of-state kids. We're going to strengthen our legislation. We're determined. We have to get aligned. We need to um, continue to develop strategic partnerships to ensure youth services and increase po positive outcomes. Every service provider in Connecticut should be able to serve this population. Once everybody has that trafficking informed lens, then that child can truly go to any services that meets his or her particular needs. We're going to finalize our, our response protocol, which we're excited about and we're close to, to finalizing. Um, we are doing a, an assessment on labor trafficking in Connecticut um, and then data collection. We um, need to finalize some of the, the way data is transmitted through our department. So last but absolutely not least, I would like to thank um, Rosie Gomez and the Administration for Children and Families. The grant truly has been extremely helpful to us. It has funded our heart coordinator, which is our right and left-hand person, um, and has been invaluable to increasing our efforts. We thank you so much, and we look forward to working with you again over the current year. And last but not least, um, there is a list of resources for you. Some of them we mentioned throughout today's presentation, so you can have access to them. Again, please feel free to reach out with questions. On this slide, you will see the different email addresses. So if you have very specific questions about pieces of the work, please fill out, feel free to reach out to us directly, and we're happy to respond to that. We will also respond to any questions that came through the queue and we will ensure that you have access to the taping of